All right, episode three coming at you. This is now one of my close friends, Nilu. This is a really cool episode. Nilu was a medical student that started ahead of me, but now she's in my class. And why she had to restart is because of a mental health issue. Nilu was dealing with significant amount of anxiety, panic attacks, and this forced her to leave medical school and then make a comeback in the following year. I don't want to say too much before we really dive into this interview, but this has been absolutely one of my favorites. I think it's really most applicable for anyone who deals with anxiety or really any student, whether you're a medical student or an undergrad or even high school. Here we go. So you are a classmate of mine. Yes. Nilu, you are from San, San, San Francisco, right? San Jose? Yeah, San Jose. You have a really good memory. Okay. Well, but really from Alaska. My grades say otherwise. My, my memory <laughs> is not great. But, um, so we met beginning of the year, we had, um, a SciFom group session. Yeah, I remember that. You, me, and Megan, and that was when I kind of first told you about my situation. Yeah. We were sitting up in the foyer, we were uh chatting about it, yeah. And it was at that point I had just posted, uh, a short YouTube video that was like, uh, I made it to med school, fuck the haters. Yeah. Like, I made yeah. it here. You told me not to tell anyone I yeah. had bipolar disorder. And look, and it was, it was, I had a really fun one. Uh, that was great. But then I remember you approached me about that video. Right, right. And so what did you, do you remember what you said? Yeah, I remember that it was a brave thing for you to do because I remember in the beginning of the school year, I was really self-conscious about kind of being back from, I was originally in class of 2020 and I left after about a month and a half because my anxiety and depression. So for the listeners, that. that's the year above me. Yes. So you started med school last year. Yeah. So I started August of 2016, but I had, after a month, I started having really bad anxiety, depression. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. I wasn't showering. I wasn't myself. And so I left. And so when I met you, I had just come back to school and I was really, really self-conscious about it because I was like, what are people going to think? Mm -hmm. And so when you posted that video, I thought that was really inspiring. That's when I approached you about it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's uh, kind of structure this yeah. conversation. Like I want to hear about last year, of course, and like what steps you've made to kind of come back and then this year do really well. But let's kind of even think back way, way back. Now, okay. was last year really the first time you've experienced significant anxiety? So all my life, I think I've been an anxious person. But even in college, I was like that type A student. I had to get grades. I was always anxious about exams. But I think with med school, I had to put, it was just something completely new. Yeah. And so when I experienced it, I've never experienced panic attacks. But in med school, I was having panic attacks every 10 minutes. Wow. To the point where I wasn't even able to go to school. I would get panic attacks even looking at school. And so that's not conducive at all. So what happened was after a month of dealing with it and going to the hospital and having to deal with student affairs, I, we all just decided I should just go home yeah. and take some time off because yeah. I was falling more and more behind. Okay. And I was giving more and more anxiety. But no, this was med school was the first time I experienced panic attacks. Okay. So you hadn't taken any like psychiatric no. medication no. Uh, therapy at all prior to med school? Maybe in high school because I was a pretty rebellious kid in high school. Ooh. But, yeah. You were a cool kid. I was the cool kid. Were you an emo kid? You were an emo kid. Middle school, I was an emo kid. Okay. What's high school Nilo look like? High school Nilo was like the low cut shirt. I was called Nelly. That was my alter ego. Nice. And I would wear like the low cut shirt. I would hang out with the cool kids. Nice. We're still back. <laughs> Going along like rapping country grammar. <laughs> rapping like, country like, grammar. Louis, like... Yeah. I used to like, yeah, I just used to ditch class all the time. Ooh, that was pretty bad. You were a badass. I really was. So when I tell people I was like that, they don't believe me. Yeah, I don't believe you still. I know. You're, like, you're a hardcore nerd. But I used to have like blonde highlights. Oh and my. It was really bad. Wow. Yeah, you okay. should have some high school friends. So then, yeah, you party wild, but you went to Berkeley, right? I went to Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Okay. Oh. I always think it's Berkeley. So you went to Santa Cruz, yeah. studied... Molecular biology. Okay, and then yeah. what was after that? So after that, I decided to move to Alaska. Damn. I know, that was really fun. Okay. Um, especially for me, because going up from like a very... Not a conservative Persian family, but... I grew up Persian, you know, no Persian girl would ever move up to Alaska. Yeah. And so, but after college, I felt, so as I said, I was really rebellious in high school. In college, I was like type A, anxious all the time, like had to get really good GPA. Yeah. And then when I ended college, I was like, this isn't the way I want to live my life. I, mm -hmm. I do not want to live my life like this. I didn't want to follow the pre-med handbook. Yeah. So I got a job offer at Harvard. 
Oh, damn. And then my two options were going to Harvard or move up to Alaska, not knowing anyone, or just kind of starting a new life. Yeah. And guess when I decided? Boom. Alaska. Alaska. Yeah. I did like a really fun adventure. I don't want to go to Harvard. I want to go to Alaska. Yeah. Alaska. Yeah. Alaska yeah. over Harvard. Not a lot of people would have made that choice. So that's yeah. really cool. It was the best decision of my life. Okay. So, you know, I imagine maybe you had anxiety in undergrad, but maybe you almost that anxiety fueled your high GPA. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It wasn't hurtful at all. And then you were like, well, screw this. Like you almost, it sounded like you could almost sense like this was going to be a bad path. Yeah. That like maybe this anxiety would take over your life or start to cause detrimental causes. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to Alaska. Yeah. Screw Alaska. I want to find some gorgeous mountain man. Yes. With a beard. You yeah. Know, I know you. I know you need it. Who's like carrying a grizzly over his shoulder or <laughs> something like that. He's like, I got grizzly for dinner. I'm still looking for that, by the way. So okay. If, if any listener is here. <laughs> yeah. The gorgeous Nilu. There we go. Looking for a mountain bearded man. Exactly. Awesome. From Alaska, preferably, right? Preferably from Alaska. Okay. Preferably who likes dogs. Okay. <laughs> so I imagine though, when you were in Alaska, like mentally you were doing well. Really right? well. Okay. I was thriving you know when people say college is like the happiest time of your life yeah i think it was one of the lowest points of my life i didn't have a typical college experience if anything i was always studying um but when i was in alaska i felt so happy okay i remember just being the happiest time of my life it was the happiest two and a half three years of my life and what were you doing I went there with no job, so I first worked at Banana Republic at the mm-hmm. mall. It was a really small one. In Anchorage, I'm In assuming? Anchorage, okay. yeah. And then I got a job at the American Lung Association, and I did public, um, like, smoke-free housing projects, trying to advocate for that, because Anchorage, and actually the entire state of Alaska doesn't have, like, a comprehensive smoke-free policy. Hmm. And their housing structures, as well as like restaurants and bars. So I was working on tobacco prevention and control for the rest of my time there with the University of Alaska. Dope. Yeah, it was really great. It was really great. It was really rewarding. um, And I want to go back because of all the connections I've built. So that's awesome. And I imagine that's the experience that made you be like, okay, well, I do want to go to medical school. Exactly. I knew I wanted to go to med school. And... But anxiety never even crossed my mind there. I never thought I would struggle. Yeah. I never thought I would struggle. If anything, I was like, I'm going to be the top of my class. Boom. You know, so it was really interesting for me. So I applied to med school, got in, yeah. and my first choice was PNLU because was I, it? Okay. Because I wanted to go back up to Alaska. Oh, so when cool. I got in, I was like, I'm all set. Yeah. And... So you so yeah. you made that move from Anchorage, Alaska, out here to the gorgeous Yakima, Yakima Washington, mm-hmm. the Palm Springs of Washington. Yeah. And were you psyched about that move, or were you like dreading it? Like, I was kinda... dreading it. Okay. Because I was so happy in Alaska. I remember, and my boyfriend at the time was up in Alaska, ah. and a lot of stress was coming from him not wanting to do long distance and mm. me trying to force it on him. Yeah. So. I wasn't happy about moving. I still wanted to be with my boyfriend, and I moved. I had to. School yeah. started. Yeah, and I imagine that kind of was a factor. It really was. And... I hated it because I it was trying to balance making him happy while I was trying to transition. I could tell he wasn't happy. Yeah. It was really stressful from okay. the get-go. So that's when you're basically walking in that PNWU door. Like, you're... I already knew he wasn't into it. And so uh, were you guys still dating at this point or yeah. broken up? Okay. We were still dating, yeah. Okay. But long distance, I've tried it before. It's very challenging. It was the worst. Um, yeah. Okay. So you're walking into med school now. So now let's kind of get into the deets okay. of last year's med school experience. So we kind of know what you're feeling like walking in that front door. When did things really start to get bad or how did, like, I imagine it wasn't, boom, all of a sudden, did it kind of escalate up It to escalated, that? absolutely. Because, so do you, so in the beginning I was fine, everything was going well, I was getting good grades, but I don't know if you recall, we have hell weeks. Remember those hell mm. weeks we had where we had like some how exams? How can I forget, yes. So our first one was when it went downhill. Okay. It was, a big, I think, the end of September. Yeah. Um, I remember middle of September, I started to get tremors in my hands. Wow. Really weird. And I was like, oh, it's just too much coffee. And then I started not sleeping. And I remember not sleeping. So you drink more coffee, combine it with the tremors. I was just shaking all the time. Wow. And I just wasn't myself, I remember. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Where the point where I was waking up at 6, studying till 10, no breaks, crying all the time. Um, really stressing out my parents, being like, I can't do this. And just, I wasn't the Nilu who I remember I was. I wasn't happy. Mm-hmm. I was always sad. 
whenever someone asked me how it's going, I was like, I hate my life. I was wow. really depressed. Um, I started not showering. And I think that yeah. was the biggest trigger, me not showering. I would just go to school just yeah. dirty in a sense. Just Who gives a shit? Yeah, yeah, I was just like, I can't even take care of myself. I don't have time. Yeah. And and then it got really bad um, where I started getting the panic attacks okay. for a lot of panic attacks. Okay, so let, well, let's pause here. So just so you listeners kind of know what osteopathic medical school is like, um, we literally have to touch each other a lot. Yeah. And and so I imagine, yeah, when you were in that state of mind of just such deep depression of not showering, I bet a lot of other people around you... Noticed. Did. And so did you, at this stage of medical school, two questions, um, how were you doing academically, but also how were you doing socially? Like, were you making any close friends that you felt you could reach out to, or what was that like? So academically, I was still doing well, mm-hmm. um, and I did have... Um, one really good friend, a couple of good friends, actually. Um, they're second years right now. And can I give them a shout out? Yeah. Isn't it one of them that I know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let's go, Kat. Catherine. Dating my who, homeboy. Yeah. Nick, Nick Lalani. Yeah. Right. So Catherine's one of my best friends. She uh-huh. still is one of my best friends. We talk all the time. And one of the other ones is Candy. Oh, yeah. They were okay. really, really, really... Um, a rock for me back then. Oh, they cool. Are. They're really wonderful people. Okay. Yeah. So you had some friends at least at that stage. Yeah. Now, prior to the panic attacks, had you really told anyone what was no. going on? Only Candy knew. Okay. Because she lives right below me, so she could she know she knew what was going oh, on. Oh, right. Did yeah. you live in the same apartment? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's describe to the listener because I think some people have panic attacks and they don't even realize it's a panic attack. Yeah. What to you was a panic attack? Oh, man, the heart pounding, dizziness, throwing up, um, fainting, like I fainted, um, shaking, sweats, tingling in my... uh, I remember when I drove myself to the hospital, I was tingling all over Mm -hmm. and throwing up um, just my heart. I remember just not being able to breathe. Yeah. I was like... (gasps) Like that. It was really bad. It was... I thought I was having a heart attack. And now when they just started, were they, could you say, triggered by anything or just out of the blue? It was it was like that buildup and then it was like, boom, it just started. Mm-hmm. It was just the most frightening thing I've ever experienced. Was it always academically related? Yeah. Okay. And also it didn't help that my boyfriend at the time wasn't, I don't want to say not supportive, but then I do want to say he wasn't supportive. It wasn't... He maybe just didn't understand. He didn't understand, yeah. Yeah, what you were really going through and being thousands of miles away certainly doesn't make it any easier. Yeah, and him never wanting to talk to me, and it was just really bad. So it was being triggered by kind of academics and also, you know, whatever was going on romantically. But then you said you were having panic attacks like every 10 minutes or something? Yeah. So then that just seems like any time. It just just... constantly, my heart was racing. And the only Mm -hmm. way I can get myself to calm down is walking that hallway just back and forth. Hours of back and forth walking. What would you do though when you were at school? I wouldn't. I didn't go to school. Wow. Like student affairs excused me. I just didn't go to school. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't be at school. Okay. So were you missing like exams? And... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I got to imagine at some point your grades were dipping. Yeah. Okay. So grades are dipping. Yeah. So what time of year were you like? All right. Like. Like, what was that process like, I need to take a step away from medical school? Because I imagine that's really difficult. I remember it was that a weekend. It was Saturday morning. And I called Tracy, who's wonderful. She's our student. She was our former student affairs coordinator. And I told her, I was like, I, I need to leave. Yeah. And I called my dad because my mom was in Paris at the time. And my mom has really bad anxiety as well. Really bad anxiety. So I knew if I told her, it would be really bad. Yeah. Um, so I told my dad. And... He just said, okay, come home. That's awesome. Yeah. So I Monday, um, Dr. Laird signed my paperwork and I was home. Wow. And just... And what time of year was this, excuse me? It was October 1st or something okay. like that. Something yeah. like that. Well, I really got to give it to you because I imagine that's a really difficult thing to do. Right. You know, PNWU, like other medical schools and most schools, I guess, in general... To my knowledge, there's not a refund policy in October, no. right? So they yeah. just boned you. You know, they did. it's that's I imagine that could be a negative 
I guess, externality that you think about when you are trying to think about your health, but it's like, well, I'm, you know, I spent all this money, you know, then I'm going to have to restart. And so that must have been an extremely difficult decision. And putting your health first, I think, is the right decision. Right. But it was extremely challenging. So, man, I give that to you. That, that was, that was been extremely difficult. It was so hard. Um, cause we are, few listeners don't know how much student loans are taking out. It is atrocious and terrifying. It's really So bad. the fact that you could still put your health first, which is, the right thing to do is, is awesome. So, okay, you move in October back to San Jose and with mom and, mom and dad or just dad, I guess? Um, mom and dad. My mom wasn't home yet, and it was so hard being back at home. Because, yeah. like, your life was, like, medical school, and all of a sudden I'm back home. And people are like, I thought you were in med school. Yeah, yeah, I was back home with, like, what do I do? Do I get a job? Do I, you know, it's so difficult. It was such a transition. Yeah. And um, we just... I, it was like my world was turned upside down. Like my whole path, I was so happy like a few months ago and then it was like a full on depression. Boom. Yeah. Like a bad panic attack months. stopped, but depression started, you know? Well, no, I mean, in the deepest of my depression, I had fleeting ideas though of suicide. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. So, I mean, I imagine that was really frightening as well. Yeah. So, so I guess let's kind of get into the, I guess the medical side and then we'll kind of deal with how you handled it. So sure. when you get back in San Jose, now, I guess, excuse me, at PNWU, had you told any medical professionals or counselors or... Yeah, Dr. Staley, our counselor at school, mm-hmm. knew. Yeah, okay. She was the only one that knew. But not any, like, uh, primary care doctor, psychiatrist? No. no. So you weren't being medicated no. by any means? No. Okay, so you get back to San Jose, you do what? I get a therapist, a psychiatrist, yeah. and I get a mindfulness therapist. Damn. So I, get, I okay, kind of worked with that. both of them. Um and I kind of was so depressed. I didn't even want to get out of bed, though. It was like yeah. I was at that stage where I only left to go to therapy. Mm. And I was just crying all the time. This was within the first two weeks. And my life really turned upside down when my dad had a cardiac arrest wow. two weeks after I got home Damn. from medical school. I did not know this detail of yeah, the story. Wow. It was pretty horrifying. Um, he was playing tennis. I don't, I don't mean to cry, but... It's okay. He was playing tennis and his heart stopped. Yeah. And is he still living? Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I'm glad you made it through there. But yeah, I mean, I I can't imagine just that stacking of the your own health crisis. Yeah. He deals with the health crisis, so you know you want to be there for him, Mm -hmm. but you got to take care of your own. Yeah, (laughs) but it worked out so well because. Um, I was so happy I was home when my dad had to deal with this because yeah. um, my mom was in Paris, my dad, my brother was in college, so he was in a coma. We just, I just had to be there for him. So, in many ways, like your anxiety attacks were blessing <laughs> yeah. in disguise. They were because I was with my dad. Yeah, I yeah. mean, so that's really a beautiful thing. And you know, I I live three thousand miles away from my parents; they're getting right. older, and so those are thoughts that I think about all the time. And so, in many ways, I'm actually glad you went through this. Um, yeah. So your dad, you know, went through that coma, but of course, I guess woke up and yeah. <laughs> you know, he's doing well now. He's alive. Yes. Shout out to Papa Nilu, yeah. kicking it. Yeah. Heart, heart still beating he's, like a true fucking champion. It's even better than before. Boom! There we go. All right, and fantastic. And I'm sure that was really motivational when you were in the cardiology unit, right? Like a few months ago. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I was um, really difficult because a cardiac arrest is really different than a heart attack. My dad's mm-hmm. heart stopped for two minutes, and if someone his coach didn't use an AED on, AUD on him, mm. he would have died. Fuck. And so, for some reason, his, like, 20-year-old coach thought to bring the defibrillator and save my dad's life. Damn. Damn. Yeah. Well, that is wild. So, I imagine you and your therapist had quite a bit to talk about. Um, that is crazy. So, you were... Okay, so let's kind of... One thing at a time here. Let's... Therapist. Mindful therapist. So, yeah. I'm a big fan of mindful... Yeah, mindful is great. Meditation. So... The fact that you were able to see a mindful therapist specifically is really cool. So let's kind of walk through that experience. Right. So was it the first therapist that you yeah. went to you ended up just driving with and having a yeah, good Yeah, I liked her so much. And the first two weeks after I got back from school, it was more dealing with school. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then it was my dad. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I still suffer, not PTSD, but I still have nightmares about my oh, dad. I bet. And so I still work with my therapist. It's, it's an ongoing process, I think. Yeah, my mother's talked to me about her anxiety, and uh, when I first got my license, I was a retard. 
<laughs> I would. I thought I was a rally car driver, you know, just going fast. I totaled my dad's Jeep two weeks after I got my license. <laughs> uh, I worked then all summer, three different jobs, like 80 hours a week to buy a car. And then two months later, I totaled that one. <laughs> So my mom used to say, like, every time the phone would ring at a random hour, she would think it was me getting in a car wreck. And, you know, it was just, like, stuff like that. So I think you having that same kind of PTSD, anxiety it's, experience yeah. totally makes sense. So you're working with your therapist at this point, and so do you meditate? Did she kind of turn you on to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I meditated. I A lot of breathing techniques, uh, yoga. I also did... um mindfulness like workshop for like 10 mm-hmm. weeks at the hospital oh, wow. actually where my dad like was in his coma and my dad was also in rehab at the time so there was laughing yoga that we did Oh, okay. because my dad's rehab program had all these different like anxiety de-stressor things so there was laughing yoga there was mindfulness there i got to take um with your dad yeah with my dad oh, wow. and my mom and dad did laughing yoga together laughing so, yoga laughing yoga so yeah you purposely laugh yeah while... Oh my god, I would love that. It was... I would definitely fart though. Hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, I there was one time it was right when me and my wife, well, I guess at the time, girlfriend started dating, and I was taking. Uh, I was leading this mental health fitness group in Sacramento called Blissify, uh-huh. and we would do walks in the park and bike rides and runs and yoga. <laughs> and so we're at a yoga class. And right at the end, end when we're in like you know Namaste and we're doing like the Om <laughs> like relaxation, yeah, you can see where I'm fucking going with this. Um, <laughs> and the room's dead quiet, and everyone just stares at me, and I just, of course, I mean, you've seen me in OPP, just burst out laughing. Oh my god, I would have died. And yeah, I mean, the fact that my girlfriend at the time didn't dump me, I was like, damn, this girl is gonna be gonna be mine forever. I know, I know, that's yeah, so, so funny. And I, thankfully, we are now married. Now, you listeners, yes. uh, and I'm a happily married man, and she's a great, great lady. And I've met her; she's really great. Yeah. So, but yeah, so she still like refuses to go to yoga classes with me because she thinks I'm going to fall yeah. at the end during the relaxation. I don't blame her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's terrible. It's the, you know, fat people problems, but whatever. Okay, <laughs> I, let's get back to the story. But, so, okay, you're starting to kind of do this, these right. meditation exercises, you know, laughing yoga, which sounds incredible. Yeah. What about uh, medication-wise? What, what was... What did that look like? So psych- my psychiatrist gave me, put me on Lexapro, and I've been on okay. Lexapro for almost two years now. So right, right from the like get-go. a year and a half, yeah. So I'm. So I, you didn't have an experience like you had to try different. No, Lexapro worked. Oh damn! Yeah, that's people. At least in my experiences, people normally don't get it right on the first try. I had to. I was on three or four medications, I think, until I got this one that I like. But you kind of got lucky. It I got so like. lucky. Okay, so it's just Lexapro. Just Lexapro, but I should say for the first two weeks, it gave me insomnia. Oh, okay. But then it. But then I, I've been on it for so long now. It's just a pill I take in the morning. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that, that year at home, San Jose, you and your dad are essentially rehabbing from two different crises of your own. Right. What else did you kind of change about your life that made you be able to handle this next year of medical school when you came back so well? I think it's definitely a combination of being on medication. Lexapro really works well for me. And another is cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness. So for me, whenever I get stressed out now, I always tell myself it's going to be over soon. You only have three more days. Like This is not permanent. Hmm. Things change. And also it taught me that panic attacks cannot kill you. Mm. which I didn't know before. You can't die from it. So whenever my heart starts to beat, I'm like, oh, it's just a reflex, nothing nothing bad. And it, just having that mentality. Like last week, I was having bad anxiety, and I kept telling myself, I'm like, this is temporary. You're going to be okay. This is just your heart um, just doing its thing. Mm-hmm. Your heart sometimes races, sometimes just, you know. And it works for me. Just that me- changing my mentality, saying that it's okay to be anxious instead of never trying to be anxious, it really works for me. Yeah. So just telling myself, this is who I am. I'm an anxious person. It's not going to kill me. Yeah. I like that state of mind. Thanks. Okay. So, so you know, you did your family have any worry about you entering back into medical school? Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. How did you alleviate that? Um, Just... I think we all alleviated together because I was really worried too. Yeah. <laughs> I was super worried. But after, honestly, after meeting all my friends, you guys, and like just 
all the mindfulness stuff I learned, it sort of flow, you know, and I've learned from therapy that emotions are really fluid. So I'm never going to be happy all the time. Mm -hmm. And so accepting that is like another way that I'm like, okay, like this is just the process, you know, life yeah. isn't a stale thing. It's just, I'm going to have good days. I'm going to have bad days. Last week was a bad week, but this week's a better week, you know? And yeah. That's not the mentality I had the first time around. Certainly. Certainly. So I have some questions, I guess, kind of when you, you know, you started medical school then again for your second time, right. but that at the same time I started medical school. So right. this, we're talking now, uh, you know, August of 2017. Yes. So I am thinking socially, like, was that, did you feel embarrassed at all to see your second year colleagues uh, who, you know, you did start with, like, and what did you tell them? Like, did they know where you went? Did they know why you left? Like kind of thing. I was so embarrassed. Yeah. I like avoided coming to school unless it was for lecture. And like, I would never walk through our main lobby foyer because mm. I didn't want to see any second years. I for, like the first two months. I was really embarrassed. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. And, but you know, I think everyone at that point knew why I had left, but I never wanted, I didn't want to see anyone besides like my close friends that I had last year, like Catherine and Candy. But yeah, I was just, I was so embarrassed. It was mm -hmm. so embarrassed. Like, I would just put my head down, put my hood up. And it's a terrible way to live. It really was. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell people in many ways, like, when I was, before I really disclosed my bipolar disorder, I thought the psych ward was the worst. Or I thought it was going to be the worst part of all of it. But it was really like once I left the psych ward and I was trying to get my life together... But I didn't feel comfortable enough telling people that I had been to the psych ward. Right. And that I couldn't drink the same way I used to because I was taking medication. And and it was just terrible. You know, like I living your life with something to be ashamed of like that. Like I kind of make a lot of analogies to, you know, we're both heter heterosexual, but someone who is homosexual and who's hiding it. And like having that something that they might be feel ashamed about right. or something like that because of the stigma is just, it's an awful, awful place to live. And so that's why I really think it's so much easier to handle mental health if you're open about that you have struggles. Because I think, at least in my experience, is so many other people, once I opened up, were like, oh, yeah, I struggle with something, too. Or my brother has bipolar or friend or, or just somehow everyone has mental health issues. Right. So I know now you live your life like that. So when did you kind of start telling people more and how did you tell people? You were actually the first person. You and Megan were the first people I told. Megan. Bedard. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, so you guys were really the first people that I had told that I was class of 2020. In that sci-fi group? In that sci-fi group. So just for you listeners, sci-fi is like when you just start med school, it's all the basic biochemistry yeah. foundations of medicine. Sci-fi. Uh, science foundations of medicine. <laughs> now, I almost flunked out of that freaking course. <laughs> I had come into med school with the bare minimum science requirements. I felt way in over my head. And I just remember being with these two smart girl or girls, thankfully, in my group, because I would have definitely got all those questions wrong. I remember when we got called on, I was like, nope, you're answering. I'm like, it's cool. I'm like, ah, it's all you. But uh, so I did post my video, and that was cool. So I didn't realize I was one of the first people that you were yeah, in school. Yeah, you, you so, and Megan. Now, after me and Megan, who did you tell? Or? So... I think, you know, I'm really close with one of my um, best two best friends here, Katie and Tara. Mm -hmm. And so that they knew about it. And then just kind of starting to, people started to find out, you know, mm -hmm. because at this point, it's like, I wanted to also help people. So when people had like questions about what exams are like, I didn't want to be like, oh, I don't know. But kind of just saying my experience and how to kind of study and shape. So people started to find out slowly. And then after a while of noticing that people didn't really care, because yeah. I thought people would be like, oh, why, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I noticed no one really cared. Not at all. Literally no one cared. Mm -hmm. And I was telling my psychiatrist, I was like, they literally do not care that I was a previously 2020. And she was like, yeah, why do you think people do? And I was like, I were don't you, know. And you were in the psych ward? No. Oh, okay. I just you got 2020. Help. Oh, 20, class of 2020. Oh, I was thinking of like those like 5250s. Oh, like yeah, the, yeah. I was like, you were admitted to the psych ward? And I, okay, my bad. Sorry. I was like, I have another friend. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, I digress. Okay, so you, you were coming out and I'm glad you did. I think that's such a better way to live, like I said. Now, did you any of your friends, and don't tell me who, of course, yeah. but like, were you able to connect with them in any sense? Like, oh, I have anxiety too. Or, Absolutely. Or, yeah. Absolutely. So many of our classmates. Yeah. And well, just so many people in general. So many people Everybody. in Everybody. And so that's what I've really found is just talking about it is just so much healthier. Because then, 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 like, by you 
telling people it makes your life easier, but in many ways it also helps them too. Maybe Absolutely. feel more comfortable about their mental health. Absolutely. So I really commend you for doing that, and you know, of course, coming on this podcast, and all like six of my listeners will be able to hear your story. It will be great, and you're great too, yeah. telling being so open about it because yeah. that's so it's so helpful and inspiring. Because especially in medical school, it's like such an anxiety-inducing thing, and just knowing that we're even though we are Type A students, we all have flaws, we all have imperfections, and yeah. um, no, it's just I just want people to feel comfortable talking to you or talking to me and talking to each other about this because I don't. The worst thing I did when I was in the previous class was not tell anyone. Yeah. And that was the worst thing I could have done. Well, I remember one real pivotal day I had in therapy where I was complaining about my anxiety and blah, I don't want to be anxious, blah, 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 blah. And my therapist said, listen, like your therapy or your, excuse me, your anxiety is never going to go away. You're always going to have anxiety. You can't expect it to get to zero. You know, with anxiety disorders, with bipolar, like you can, of course, minimize the symptoms and and control them better, but you're never going to get to zero. So don't have that expectation. And so I want to talk about, you said a few weeks or maybe a month ago or so, you had a yeah. fairly significant, again, panic attack. Yeah. And you sort of thought you were like past that. So how did you handle it then that time? So that's a, that did really happen because we, I think we, it was our, during our cardiology block. It was the, mm-hmm. right before the third cardiology, our final. Mm-hmm. And I remember just the same symptoms, heart beating really fast, sweating, tingling, those feelings were coming back again. But like I said before, as for me, I just not necessarily ignore it, but just kind of, if you embrace it, Mm. being like, it's not going to hurt me. It just, for me, it doesn't trigger the same thing that it did because if it was the last year, I would have, it would, I would have let it take over. But now Mm. that I know exactly what's going on in my body, um, both physically and mentally, I just kind of let it pass and just let it be, not let it affect me and just kind of be like, it's not going to kill me. It's just temporary Yeah. because there's only so much your heart can beat fast before your sympathetic reflex just goes down, you know, yeah. and eventually it did happen. But now in that state of mind where your heart's just kind of fluttering sympathetic response, like I know you're trying to think about, okay, this is going to end, this is going to end, but what can you do to alleviate and maybe make that end to come a little bit quicker? Sleeping yeah. and running. Oh, that was okay. a really good thing for me. Whenever I feel really stressed out, I take a quick nap to like restart. Or remember I told you when it first happened, I walked back and forth the hallway. I found that walking or running does the same thing where even though it's kind of weird because you think it'll speed your heart up, it actually makes me tired mm. and it just brings my heart rate down after. No, that makes total sense. I don't know how to explain it. I mean, one thing me and my wife sort of joke about with me is when I start to feel anxious or, you know, I do have temper problems... And when she starts to see maybe me become a little manic, hypomanic, whatever you want to call it, she's like, go to the freaking gym, will ya? And I find like if I do squats or especially deadlifts on those days and really try to physically exhaust my body, my mind then doesn't have the energy to feel anxious and it literally will slow down. So I found that squats, especially squats, deadlifts are my like anti-anxiety. It worked. Yeah. Do you feel like... Just a, like fresh after like restarting. Yeah, and just like a feeling of exhaustion. Like it's, I feel like it's hard to feel really anxious if you're just so so tired. It's like I felt. Yeah. You know, I, if I was sitting around doing nothing, maybe I had way too much caffeine, really wired up. That's when my anxiety would go through the roof. Exactly. And I also one of the biggest things was when I was in that old class, I used to drink like ten cups of coffee a day. Wow. Now I stop drinking coffee at one. Oh, good. Because I've noticed that my heart will race, and then Mm -hmm. um, I can't sleep that night, and that's not okay. So So, finishing off here, if someone maybe just had their first panic attack, and they're scared shitless, as I'm sure you were, what would you tell them if they were sitting here? That panic attacks can't hurt you. I think that's the biggest thing, that they cannot hurt you, and just know that emotions are fluid and it's normal to feel like this it's normal to have anxiety but just ride it out don't try to fight it ride it out and like go on a walk get some fresh air talk to someone but just know that they cannot hurt you hell yeah well that's uh i think that's a good place for us to end well you know just so the listeners kind of understand this year you know you've of course had a little bit of anxiety but you've dealt with it you're passing all your classes. I imagine getting better grades than you were, at least, you know, the first two months of last year. You're doing really, really well. So, you know, you're an example for everyone else uh, to 
to handle it they're give themselves confidence that they can handle it if they're dealing with any mental health crisis and yeah thank you so much for talking with me today on a mental health talk with logan noon uh working title we're open to suggestions <laughs> tweet at us write to us i don't know thank you so much this is so great yeah well yeah. this was a, this was a blast cheers Cheers. Shaboom. And that is a wrap on episode three. I want to thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Both me and Nilu really appreciate you listening. And we hope that you share this with your friends. If you like the podcast, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, however you really listen to the podcast today. But most importantly, I want to thank you for being here. I really appreciate you listening to me and Nilu. Next week, we have on someone who's been dealing with ADHD from a very young age and still was able to succeed and gain entrance into medical school. So come back for next week. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.